Um, why don't we get started here? Anna, remind me, I need to buff up on my Robert's rules as always, but do I need a motion to open the meeting or I just say um, we are getting started? You need a roll call roll of call. the participants. Roll call, roll. Yep. Okay. Thank you for the reminder. Um, I will do a roll call starting off opening the rec commission meeting for July 27th, 2021. Casey Atkins. Whoever's present on the um, rec commission can go next. Pete Funkhauser here. Paul Baum here. Hi, it's open meeting. Hi, Paul. Jim Howard. All right, Anna, Any, go ahead, Anna. I was just gonna say, I'm Anna McEwen, the recreation director for the uh, couple new faces that we have on here tonight. Um, and I just want to recognize we have Andy Dutton from the BD Center. We also have the Select Board Committee Liaison, Matt Johnson, and um, John Hickling. It looks like you're joining us this evening as a member of the public. Hello, that is correct. My name is John Hickling, and I live at 111 Monument Street. Excellent, excellent. Um, and Amrith, uh, I would love to just take a moment to have you and Jim or James introduce yourselves um, as the newest members. You are a new uh, finance committee member, uh, liaison rather. And Jim, welcome to the board. So uh, Jim, why don't you kick it off just a quick introduction of who you are and why you're here, and then we'll turn it over. Sure, thank you. So again, yeah, Jim Howard. Um, yeah, I'm very excited to, to join the Rec Commission. I guess tonight's my first meeting. Uh, I've been a Concord resident for about you know, a little over five years. Uh, so I was looking to get involved. And um, luckily enough, I was able to join the Rec Commission. So I'm very happy to be here and learn about it and meet some new people. So thank you. We're happy to have you. Um, and Amrith, please correct my pronunciation if I'm off or let me know if I have it correct. You have it correct. Uh, yeah, Casey, you have it correct. Are you able to hear me? I'm yes. getting a weird. Okay. So, uh, yeah, my name is Amrit. Um, real official legal name is about a half a mile long. So, everybody calls me Amrit and we'll leave it at that. Um, I am new to town. I moved into Concord May something or the other. I am also the newest member on the FinCom. Uh, before moving to Concord, I used to live in Sterling for about 17 years, um, where I was on a number of committees and boards. And most recently, I was the town moderator for two terms, which just ended the last town meeting. So I'm the newest member on the FinCom, as I mentioned. And at our last meeting, which was last week, um, I picked up the liaison spot to the Rec Commission. Um, I'm really excited to be part of the FinCom and part of the uh, the Rec Commission as liaison and get to meet more people in town and um, help where I can. We're so happy to have you, especially with your extensive background and in, in, um, municipal involvement. So thank, thank you, you so much for being part of the community so early, especially if you just moved um, here so recently. So yeah, the so boxes awesome. are not yet done. So yeah, we still have some of those. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Well, welcome to town. And just as a heads up, uh, Amrith is going to sign off around 730. He has to pop off to another meeting tonight. Great. Um, let's see. So looking at the agenda that I sent out to everybody, um, we usually kick it off with a approval of minutes from the last meeting, which and are was May and out a little bit. On those... Can you hear me now? Uh, yep. Okay. Approval of the last meeting's minutes. Um, does everyone have a copy of those? And does anyone need a little bit of time to review or are you ready to make a motion to approve them? I'm ready to make a motion to approve the minutes of the last meeting. I second that motion. Great. 
Next, Casey, is uh, the public input. John, if you're interested in talking now, you're welcome to. If you're here to just excuse observe. Me, excuse me, don't we have to vote on the minutes? Yeah, you have to have a vote, right. I'll vote for it. Yeah. I voted, somebody say, I moved, somebody second, but I think we have to have a roll we call. We certainly vote. do. Thank you, Pete. Pete, why don't you pick us off? I vote yes. Casey Atkins, yes. Is that a yes that I hear? <laughs> Uh, Paul Baum, yes, I vote to approve. And Kim Jim Howard, James. Jim Howard, yes. Okay, great. And you prefer to go by Jim or James? Yeah, Jim's good. Thank okay, you. all right. I just want to make sure I'm not getting too familiar too soon. <laughs> okay, uh, moving on to the next agenda item. Um, any public input? We have some folks on here. We have the esteemed Laura Diamond, who is a PT at the BD Center. Uh, Jen Lutz, looks like she was just able to join us as a Rec Commission member, and John Hickling. Um, would any member of the public like to uh, submit input at this time? So Casey, I, I so so my name's John Hickling, 111 Monument Street. I'm also a member of the Finance Committee, but but um, I am not the official observer, as, as you know. I noticed public input is on the agenda twice but there's at the uh, at the end another. It's that input. important. It's that important. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Public absolutely. public input is always important. Sometimes it's helpful to have it at the beginning of the meeting and at the end. That may have been a clerical oversight, but I think it also is pertinent to how meetings are run, since there's plenty of conversation to be had at the end of the meeting too. Well, okay. I, I may wait. I may I defer till the till the second uh, input. Thank you. That's fair. Absolutely. Okay. Um, hearing no other public input, why don't we move on to the department or rather appointments. And Anna, do we have this on here for informational purposes mainly? Yeah, uh, primarily just so everybody has a reminder each month of when terms are ending and you'll see um, Jim's term is now listed there as well. So he'll end um, the month following the 2024 town meeting. So we've, we've roped him in for a couple of years. Um, and uh, it, again, it's just a reminder to people of when their terms are ending. Thank you. Uh, moving on to item number four, we have department update. Um, and it sounds like first up, we have the administrative code update and vote. And this was sent around. Does everyone have a copy? I'll share it right here as well. So this was the, uh, it seems like forever ago at this point, but this was the last version that we had discussed and reviewed. Um, as a reminder, we had a, a conversation with Kate Hodges. She jumped on and supported us uh, through this process um, and made some revisions based on what she was comfortable with. And this is where we've ended. So if everybody um, needs a minute, I can scroll down a smidge if you don't have it open on your own computers. And then we do need a vote uh, to send this to Kate to bring to town manager. Is there any further discussion from the commission members? Only, only that I think we've been through this several times and all the revisions have been quite productive. And I think what we have here is perfect. Excellent. As perfect as perfect as it could be. <laughs> Anyone else? Pete, you're on mute. I agree with Paul. We've been over this with a fine tooth comb, so let's just approve it and move on. All right, so which of you gentlemen would like to make the motion? I would like to move that we accept um, the revised administrative code, revisions dated 6-8-2021. I second. Excellent, uh, let's do a roll call vote. Paul, would you like to kick us off? Uh, I vote aye, yes. Pete? Yes. Casey Atkins? Yes. Jim Howard? Yes. Jen Lutz? Yes. Excellent. Paul? Oh. Okay. 
Uh, we will move on to uh, 4B, tennis backboard installation at Emerson Park discussion. Anna, do you want to kick us off there? I, I just have one question on the administrative code. What happens next? Does this go to the town manager for approval? Um, yes. Does it get posted? Yeah, okay. Yep, yep. So next I send it to um, the deputy town manager and the town manager, and I believe that they bring it to the next select board meeting for approval there. Good, thank you. Yes. Which I believe, Matt, that's in two weeks or so. So we should have this in place for the next meeting. That's correct. August 9th. Great. Okay. Um, so tennis backboard installation. Um, just to bring everybody up to speed, the Emerson tennis courts um, years ago had um, a backboard. It's called. It's a back then. It was a large wooden. Um, hanging piece that goes on the fence of the tennis courts and people can use it to play tennis by themselves pretty much. It, it allows a bounce back. Um, it's a practice tool, it's a learning tool. There was one there for years, um, got worn out, was removed and residents of Hubbard Street are interested in having one reinstalled. Um, the conversation that they've had with mm -hmm. Kate Hodges and myself was mm -hmm. um, that we would be uh, willing to consider that option if they're willing to fundraise for it, which they are more than happy to do, the neighborhood. Um, so they've been working hard to fundraise money. These backboards cost, depending on the type, you get three to $6,000. Um, and then it was brought to our attention from another resident um, off of another neighboring street that the noise can be a bit much, um, that people were going to the backboard and using it at six, seven in the morning, um, and the echo of the ball hitting that wall was, was a nuisance. Um, so I wanted to bring it to you guys to talk about that a little bit. Um, and I wanted to point out a, a couple of different things. I've reached out to um, the US Tennis Association. Uh, we work with them with our tennis programs. We're a US Tennis Association affiliate um, to ask their advice on backwards and the technology nowadays. Um, and they did provide me with some links and information about the backboards that are now produced and how they are sound lessening. They've made them out of new materials, which help to reduce that bounce back noise. Um, there's different studies, there's, there's different types as well. Um, again, all within that, you know, three to $6,000 range. Um, so I do believe that the technology nowadays is better than what it was when the backboard was there previously. I couldn't even figure out the year that it was there last. Uh, that's how long ago it was. So just looking for feedback, um, you know, ways that we could consider this sort of request if it goes with, um, you know, our mission of improving our parks and, and the resources available in our parks. And also interested in hearing um, some alternatives if anybody has any ideas of, uh, of location for it, if not at Emerson, um, and also potentially ways that we could help mediate the um, nuisances if, if those are to pop up again with folks. So just looking for some feedback and, and opinions on that. And a real quick, I believe, especially in the Emerson courts, there are time restrictions of when people can use the courts. And can you remind us what those are? Yeah, so all of our courts are a general sun up to sundown uh, sort of concept. And there used to be um, more signage than there is now. So that's one of the, the pieces I've been thinking about. We could definitely update the signage there to make it more clear to residents uh, when the preferred use times are. There's no lights at, at those courts, so there shouldn't be people there past sunset. Um, it seemed like from the neighbors that it was more the morning, early morning players going to get in some hits before work. Do you know what the time frame used to be for Emerson? I feel like it was like either 8 a.m. or like 7.30 a.m. maybe. I don't know that off the top of my head. I can try and figure that out, but I don't know what it was. It's possible figuring out what the previously agreed upon time was and reinstating that in, in the signage. They did say that at points, the recreation department um, would go and lock the courts at night um, and then go and reopen them. So that might've been unofficial open close times. Um, we don't necessarily have staffing in place to be able to do that every day. I'm not sure who used to do that for them, if it was the custodian or whatnot, but not something I'm against, but something that would take a little planning, you know, if we did get to the point where we felt like we needed to lock the courts. So, so Anna, I, I'm on funding, I'm wondering, so, so my tenure on the CPC is new, so I don't have all the details, but um, 
I wonder if the residents are aware that sounds like it'd be eligible for CPA funding um, uh, through the application process. Um, you know, I, I'm wondering if it, well, I, I don't know if it would be, we'd have to evaluate it, but there's a, there's an avenue for potential funding other than the fundraising. Um, I just want to throw that out there. So that might be a useful information um, to that group. Thank you. Yeah, I'll certainly uh, pass that on to the residents that have been interested in this project um, and make sure that they're aware of CPA and the availability. Um, I don't know the ins and outs necessarily of what would qualify or what wouldn't. There's not necessarily a lot of preservation happening with adding this back in since the old unit's completely removed, but um, certainly worth considering. If that's a good point. I, I think it meets the criteria. You know, the recreation is one of the four buckets of funding eligibility, yeah. and I think this um, it doesn't have to literally be preservation. It, 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 they ought to check that, but I think it does meet the eligibility requirements. Great. <clears throat> Any other opinions or feedback on, on that? Yeah, this is, this is Pete. Am I off of mute finally? Yeah. Um, you know, it'd be a shame not to have a Backboard, I think they're really an important part of a tennis court because it allows people to practice their shots and all when there's no one to play with. I'm, I'm fully um, sympathetic with neighbors who don't want to hear the bam, bam, bam noise. But it seems to me that simply imposing time constraints would solve that problem. Um, you could open the courts at dawn, but you could open the backboard at eight o'clock, let's say. and uh, and as long as that was made clear to everybody and enforced, I don't think there would be a problem and I don't think the neighbors would mind. How many neighbors complained? Um, one household. On Thoreau Street? Yes. Yeah, so they could be approached with, uh, with the issue of time and maybe they would be satisfied in their complaint if they knew that it wouldn't begin till a certain hour, then we're over, over and done with that one. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping too that um, when I can share some information on the new manufacturing and the new design of these right. units, that mm -hmm. it might also be peace of mind. I'm sure that they haven't thought about this since it was taken down and then uh, got wind of the fundraising and are nervous again. So I'm hoping that yeah. also might help peace of mind. <clears throat> Well, this sounds like a, a problem that we can solve pretty easily if, uh, if we work on it with the neighbors. I think from a recreation commission perspective, I, I think this would be beneficial improvement to that facility from a purely mm -hmm. recreational standpoint. There, there may be problems, but I think it sounds good. Yeah. I don't live there, but it sounds good from a holistic recreational <laughs> perspective. <laughs> Yeah, we, I also um, made sure to touch base with our tennis coordinator, who's worked with us for a number of years, um, and she was able to, you know, weigh out the pros and cons for me as well, including the sound. That was the first thing that she, she brought up as a question, but said that they would absolutely utilize it uh, for Concord Recreation tennis programs and practice opportunities. Um, so just strengthening what you just said, Paul. Um, so if that's, if that's how everybody feels, um, I will have a conversation with both parties that were, were interested and uh, throw this by Kate Hodges again, make sure that she's aware of what we've discussed and um, move forward from there. I, I think we'll be able to find a, a good middle ground for everybody. Uh, worst case scenario, I also reached out to uh, the CCHS athletic director to see if you know we get tons and tons of pushback if maybe placing a backboard at one of the high school tennis courts, which is close to Hubbard Street, Thoreau Street, those communities, those residents could still walk over, uh, but it certainly isn't in the same ears reach as the courts on, uh, on Emerson, uh, Thoreau Street. So as a backup, um, we're, we're having some discussions about that as well. So if we needed to move the backboard, if it truly was intrusive. So all good things. Great, thank you for your input. I appreciate it. Okay, great, thanks, Anna. Moving on to program updates. Andy, uh, you want to start with BD Swim and Fitness? Sounds good, thank you. Um, just to cover membership, uh, we're at uh, 1,026 right now. Uh, we've increased by 83 members since February. Uh, the bulk of those have been uh, students and couples. Uh, 
Uh, we're seeing the population from across the street come over and utilize us, which uh, we're certainly encouraging as far as uh, young family members will say. Um, families have increased uh, nine in June and eight in July. So uh, always uh, a good focus when we see the families coming our way. On the program front, um, August is big. Uh, we go live with our offerings on August 1st. Sign up for members is August 11th, non-members August 18th. Uh, the fall programs start uh, September 13th, uh, basically a week after that holiday. Uh, we've added um, some private swim lessons in August that are uh, doing well, uh, or about to do well, we'll say. Uh, we've got a, a new edition of a scuba um, element um, instruction coming our way, hopefully in September, getting that organized now. And we're also expanding our Otters uh, Youth Swim Program just to give um, more options uh, as far as times. Uh, this is something that we sort of learned from uh, closure slash pandemic, you know, how to manage that program a little bit better. On the marketing side, uh, we've got White Pond in our doors right now doing swim lessons and having general access. Uh, great to get that exposure. Uh, great to give them uh, a place to go uh, during uh, tough times with the water. Uh, but we're also doing just our, our, our free elements as far as um, emails with constant contact and Facebook. Uh, do have a brochure that's uh, scheduled to go out um, in the next uh, week or so. And with it, uh, we'll cover uh, BD and Hunt, uh, pushes group exercise quite a bit. Other marketing things, we got a blood drive uh, is, is back with us September 25th. Uh, we're scheduled to do a road race on October 30th, which will be new for us. Haven't had that happen in a while. And then the, the traditional trunk or treat uh, event uh, with recreation on October 31st. Um, shutdown is back with us uh, this coming August as well. So August 23rd through the 29th, uh, we'll have facilities in the door. We'll have compass in the door. Uh, we're utilizing some endowment monies, uh, about $22,000 to get at some pumps and impellers and boarding and locker rooms to signage uh, on doors uh, to a new vacuum for the pool uh, to hopefully a drinking fountain that you can use uh, your bottle to fill up on. So, you know, nice, nice to have those monies to work with, nice to have this timing and we'll say support from the town overall uh, as we get into um, we'll say a new and uh, more of a normal fall. Um, and just to add to that for some other BD stuff. So um, Andy and his team are doing a really great job trying to fill those nook and cranny time slots at the BD center. We see a large opportunity in filling those downtimes with rentals. It's a really hands-off approach um, in, a, in a revenue builder. So Andy's been working with some out of town organizations, um, some teams that have lost swim time at pools that closed during the pandemic to set up some new relationships and some new rentals, which has been really exciting. Um, also, like Andy mentioned, we, uh, we're gonna be working hard to bring some new events to the BD Center. And, and one of those things will be um, our road race. So we typically do the Sleepy Hollow 5K in October has typically been housed through the Recreation Revolving account and at the Hunt Recreation Center. Uh, but moving forward, any and all fitness and exercise based events uh, are going to be run through the BD Center. So the, the funds hit the enterprise account. So we're working creatively to fill and, and create some program opportunities that aren't necessarily, um, you know, right in the swim lanes or, or in the fitness rooms uh, throughout town. So um, these are some new things coming your way. We'll, we'll keep you updated and appreciate you spreading the word to folks um, to come and participate and enjoy these, these new options. Um, staffing updates, we are closing the program manager, the aquatics program manager position that's been posted online, I believe today it closes. So Andy and I will be reviewing those applicants and hopefully have a couple of interviews with candidates uh, early next week. We're hopeful that this position um, will get filled with one of these candidates and, and we'll have somebody in place mid-August at the latest is our goal so they can help take over the fall program. So. We've uh, continued to struggle getting really good applicants, but we're hopeful that uh, someone in this pool will be the one for us and, and the right fit. Um, so that's update on staffing. Uh, and then the other thing I just wanted to make everybody aware of, um, I'm not sure if you've heard of Christian's Law before. It's related to um, 
requirements for facilities to have uh, life jackets for all participants. Right now, it's if you are at an open water body. Um, but there's been legislation submitted to switch that law to also include indoor, indoor pools um, and municipal swim areas, which would, as the writing stands, include our kiddie pool, dive well, lap pool, therapy pool. Um, this would affect places like Six Flags if they have a water slide um, or a log ride or anything like that that has water. It would now require people to be swim tested um, in order to not wear a life jacket. So as you can imagine, that's a huge, huge undertaking for aquatics facilities. Um, we would be required to purchase enough life jackets for the capacity of our pool decks, which would be hundreds of life jackets that we would be required to purchase and store and, and upkeep. Um, and there with the original Christians law has been very limited uh, funding available to support uh, the purchase of, of life jackets. And those, those funds that are available typically allow people to purchase those orange um, like boat life jackets that just go up around your neck and aren't really the sort of life jacket that you would want during a swim lesson or, or a program like that. So um, the, the legislation, again, it's, it's not clear why this was submitted. Um, we're part of the Massachusetts Recreation and Park Association and, and uh, the organization is reaching out to the representative from Springfield who did this change to see if we can understand what happened? Is this a couple of um, you know residents that are really pushing for it? it? You know what's the what's the background? What's going on for them to want to do this? Um, it also looks at some of the wording choices that they have in the law um, that aren't um, they aren't well written. To uh, in you know in one section it says it will include pools, indoors municipal pools, and then um, in another section it says it will not include pools. So it's kind of a messy. Uh, a bill right now, but I will be writing um, a letter to our local representative um, with our stance on changes to that law and the effects that it could have financially and otherwise on our program. So once I get that written, I can share with you all and you're welcome to send to our representatives as well. I would appreciate that support. Um, we're not, the, the organization MRPA is not necessarily worried that this is going to move forward because again, it doesn't make much sense right now, um, but we still wanna make sure that our voices are heard. So I'll share that information with you all as I get the letter written. Um, Andy and I are staying on top of the movement of that bill and, and we'll keep you updated if anything does progress more quickly. So just wanted to keep everybody in the loop on that. Thanks, Anna. Yeah. Perhaps this is in response to the open water swimming debate that's going on with Walden Pond and White's Pond. I don't know. It could be. I mean, the, the way that Christian's law is written right now, if a group did go to Walden Pond, they'd have to bring their own life jacket. So if we as a field trip went to Walden Pond, we have to bring enough life jackets for all of our, our swimmers that we bring, which is why we don't go to open water body field trips. Um, so the law is in place to support those facilities, but now they're trying to include indoor facilities, splash pads, play pools, things like that. I don't even know how you swim test splash a child. Pad? For a splash, yeah, pad. splash pad, that'd be interesting. You know the um, idea. The idea of life jackets. You're right. It, it makes no sense. Um, it does if you're in a boat and and you know, there's an accident, but but if you're in the water, um, especially in a pool, and you're not a you're not swim tested, you wear a life jacket. Does, correct. Does if you mean, don't pass the swim test, you would be wearing a life jacket. So kids instead of swimmies would have to wear a life jacket. Um, yes. Huh. And we don't even allow those things in our pools. Um, the only item that would be allowed is a Coast Guard approved life jacket. If somebody was to bring them or if someone requested them, we do <laughs> have some, but we don't have enough for a full pool deck of every shape and size person. And as you can imagine, that would add up very quickly if we, we did need to stock a closet. Of it sounds like it's complicated enough that it probably goes through several versions and lots of other things before could possibly become law. It's also important to note that both our state rep and our state senator were fully in support of open water swimmers having access to swim across Walton Pond, which is just an important footnote, but it sounds like this is really just an FYI about things that could be coming up. 
in yep. terms of legislation that impacts the BD Center. Just yep. quickly back in terms of programming notes on the BD Center. Um, Andy, with promoting the BD programs for the fall, do you guys do anything at White's Pond, like um, hand out the brochures there or like put on people's cars, you know, marketing opportunities at White's while it's there and also the students through Concord Rec. Um, I know at one point you could get at the end of the week, your child is at this level swim and maybe have a continue, you know, continue the success call, you know, the BD Center number today to schedule your fall um, lessons or go online on, on August 11th, et cetera, to sign yeah. up. Yeah, so absolutely, you know, um, the White Pond lessons are, are certainly a productive time and, and sort of set the, the table for hopefully uh, uh, a bit more organized time as far as a 10 week program. So uh, going to capture that group, that's that's the beauty of a connection with uh, recreation slash White Pond um, is our ability to reach out directly with those and, and speak with uh, some authority as far as what they've been up to and what uh, opportunities we have uh, coming up for them as well. Uh, we're also gonna just tap into um, the White Pond membership group as a whole. Um, they wrap up uh, August 22nd with um, Pond Access and with it wanna um, you know, give them a heads up, more of a heads up. They've been in our door and we've been um, you know, sort of uh, engaged with them as, as much as possible, you know, still trying to be welcoming and enjoy your time, but here's who we are as far as membership and, and aquatics. But with that um, group sort of wrapping up and, and having a nice option as far as indoors with us, uh, we're just gonna do a promotion related to no joining fee and really, you know, sort of set the table that, yep, you're wanted and, and with it, uh, here's, here's something that is hopefully a benefit to you uh, to get started with uh, us if, if they're new. You know, don't know the exact number, but you know, there's, there's probably, I'm just gonna say like 15 to 20% of the current White Palm population is BD members the right, uh, a good group to work with uh, as far as uh, hopefully interest in, in water and, and all that goes with swim lessons and being safe. Are there is, any is white pond, is white plans? Sorry. Is White Pond still close to swimming? Yeah, so I was gonna get into that in a little bit, but we can talk about it now. So- um, Well, I, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to talk about, the, it was a question for Andy in terms yeah. of, um, do we know how much relief BD is giving to White Pond um, exiles right now. Is there, do we know that just on the, just on the BD part of yeah. it? So, you know, tracking wise, you know, all of their swim lessons are, are moved over. Uh, so they've got a good block right now from uh, 10 to 1130. Come 12 o'clock, we open our doors to them from, you know, 12 to three and give them some pools to work with, a lap lane to work with. And, you know, it's all weather dependent a little bit and, and schedules, but we had about 40 uh, that first day uh, come in through the door. Um, 40, you say 40? 40, 40 families come through the door. So with it, um, it's been that range from, uh, we'll say 40, uh, 20 to 40, as far as who's take advantage of it, uh, Monday through Friday. Uh, Emerson Pool is their location on the weekends. Yeah, so to, to add to that, um, for those quickly that don't know, White Pond closed on July 6th due to um, a blue-green algae bloom that spread throughout the pond to a level that required the state to come in and, and uh, do some evaluations and determine that the entire pond needed to be closed in, uh, until further notice for all swimming and water-related activities. Um, so at that point in time, we came up with some plans to um, try and provide some swimming options to our the 600 ish members um, that do have a white pond pass. So as Andy mentioned, Monday through Friday, our members are welcome to go and swim indoors at the BD Center between 12 and three. Week one, we had 102 white pond members uh, come and participate and uh, nine of their guests also joined, which was great. Uh, because of the bloom, we also had to move our swim lessons and didn't want to cancel those. So Andy and his staff have done a great job fitting us in um, and they're supporting 41 kids uh, in swim lessons who otherwise potentially wouldn't have been at swim lessons at the BD Center. Um, with every person that comes into the BD Center, uh, the, the front desk gives them uh, a membership pamphlet, some welcome information about the center, and then a BD Center staff person escorts, walks with um, the members 
downstairs uh, to our locker room space, you know, kind of does a, a quick intro of the spaces that are available, welcomes them to have a full tour if they're interested in doing that. So we're trying to have a touch with every single person that comes in the door. And so far that's been uh, well received. It looks like Jen had to pop off, but um, she had mentioned that she was getting a lot of good feedback from her peers uh, who have children who typically go to White Pond and are now going to Beatty and they had never been there before. So um, we're excited to offer this membership opportunity to White Pond members. Like Andy said, it'll be um, no joining fee through the end of the White Pond season slash early September with flexibility. Um, and we're hopeful that we will, um, you know, pique the interest of a couple of new families in town that might be interested in, in joining the BD Center. So that's, that's been so, great. So since we're talking about White Pond, um, just a couple of comments. Um, so it's closed and there's a um, harmful algal bloom problem. And I understand that is the some remediation going on um, at the pond. But as far as the causation, the, the causes of the problem, I, I I haven't looked at this for a long time. Um, I know there have been samples taken. I, I know as there have been funding pro projects funded for White Pond improvement, which includes monitoring. My question is, what do we know and, and who is trying to track down the causes? Maybe they're obvious, but because we'll be just in, in reactive uh, sure. mode for a while. Is, is there any benefit from from the health department or recreation department or anybody looking more deeply into this, or maybe that somebody has in the past. I just don't know. Yes. So you're spot on with that. Um, the pond residents over the years have done a great job collecting data, taking samples, um, you know. Whoop, you froze. Anna. cracking the, the algae and the blooms uh, throughout the under spin uh, measurements. So the, the Board of Health um, is working closely with some of those residents who are interested in and are involved in doing that. Um, and most recently, the town manager has worked with the Recreation Department and Natural Resources and the Board of Health. Um, and we will be, uh, I believe, as far as I know, last I heard, um, engaging in a, a testing program. So the town will take over testing of the pond. So we have some standards in place for where the tests happen, when the tests happen. Um, so that will be a great addition that the White Pond Advisory Committee is um, is is very happy about. Um, in terms of the cause of the algae, I'm, I'm no blue grain algae expert, but um, the pond pretty much sits at the bottom of a, a valley. Um, above that valley has been farmland for years. Um, and so the runoff that naturally comes from those fields um, when they were farmed and chemicals were used um, has certainly presumably added to the algae growth. Um, the town is um, taking on a very robust stormwater management system in this phase of the White Pond renovations, um, which will be kicking off this fall to try and help uh, remediate any further runoff and waste going into the pond. Um, and that, that should help, but otherwise, um, you know, it's a natural occurrence. It, just because it's at our beach on our side doesn't mean that the algae is at Sachem's Cove, which is why it, it's a very challenging um, bloom to manage, especially for the public. So we've worked really closely with Board of Health to, to make sure that the community is aware. We're still staffing the beach, even though it's closed, so we can educate the public that does come down to the beach. Um, and, it, and the park itself is open. We call it a park. There's there's the trees, there's the sand area. Um, people can go and just enjoy the nature space of the pond. Plenty of people were doing that, having a picnic, reading a book on their lunch break, things like that. So the, the park remains open, but swimming remains right. closed. Is there, so we have a lot of data and some of the causes are kind of obvious. The remediation seems to be sporadic and on an emergency basis. Is, is there a, uh, a white pond expert who's kind of taking a look at all the data and can come up with, maybe there's no permanent solution. Maybe it's just having these algal scoopers on duty 24 seven to prevent it. But right. I'm just kind of wondering, we, we seem to be reacting. Um, is there any plan to do anything other than reacting? Is it feasible? Right. I mean, we have to also remember that the town just took over ownership of the white pond beach area a few years ago. So the management and the data um, prior to the town taking the pond over, again, um, is valuable in its own right, but it's not necessarily to a consistent standard that the town or the Board of Health feels comfortable using as 
permanent data. Um, people are testing differently. They're using different methods. They're testing from different locations. Um, the town is uh, taking part in a pilot program right now with a scientist. Um, it, it's, I don't even know the exact uh, way that it works, but there's a unit that's going to be put, it, it is in the pond and it's supposed to be helping to kind of aerate and remove the toxins um, without being intrusive. You know, there's chemical um, treatment for the algae, but um, you know that hasn't been a direction that the town has wanted to go just for a, a number of reasons. Um, but those are things that the Board of Health and the town manager yeah, work I, I, I don't know if the select board is, yes, the town is just, I'm not pointing fingers saying the town has just taken ownership of it, but is it something to be done in the future um, on a deeper basis as far as prevention, remediation? I, I don't know what the answer is, but to sort of to get out of this, um, reaction mode and you know some of the things for stormwater control yes they're going to help but is that enough I, I just don't know so I'm just wondering if there's any larger um, effort that's feasible and warranted to protect the, the resource just open that up for discussion not necessarily pointing my finger at the select board here but I don't know it's it's a it's a board of health recreation. It's, it's, it's a multi-committee type of issue. Looks like Anna had to drop off to address her connectivity issues. Um, and I don't I, know I do if think, I think the select board Matt wants to speak to this. All I, all I would say is that- an ongoing issue for the, years. The, of course. That the uh, runoff deflection that's planned for the build out it is a, a really proactive measure and i i think it has some promise i think that it is very difficult to pinpoint the source of this it could be failing septics from the nearby residents um it, it could be a lot of of things it could be climate change of course is exacerbating the problem or you know the temperatures that we have um so you know, I think, and then this new program, I think is quite innovative and in that the town is taking initiative there. So I think we're doing a lot personally. No, I'm not saying we're not. I, I just wonder if it's, uh, if it's pointing towards a solution or are we just reacting? To, I'll, I'll just take, we can table it, but um, I, I just think it has been a problem for a long time. We're, we're dealing with it. It may never go away. But I think um, in order to build up the confidence in, in the town residents and that asset going forward, um, maybe we need to do more. I'll just leave it there. I, I think I would just say, you know, you bring up important questions, Paul. I will echo um, Matt that what Concord is doing is actually very proactive. And when it, when my understanding, at least, when it was gifted to the town was in part because they needed the expertise and the resources in order to do the stormwater management, in order to do the studies to determine what the issues were that were causing the algae blooms. And that was part of the larger vision for, for the gifting to the town. That's my understanding. And please, anyone correct me if I'm off there. Um, sorry about that. My Our power flickered and my internet is down, so I'm on my phone, but... Um, so just running back in, but yes, Casey, you're, you're, you're correct. And, and Matt, thanks for chiming in while I was off there for a second. The town is um, taking as many measures as possible to help remediate the problem. But again, it's a natural occurrence. So I, I don't think there will be a time where it will be safe to say it will never be in the pond or, or be back in the pond. You know, we've had uh, years of operation. I think 2016, they said was the last year they had a bloom of this size that closed to the entire pond. Um, and since then, it's been sporadic. So, again, um, it's hard. Yep. For as long as I moved back here in, in 2010, Paul, and it was every summer there was. Oh, no, no, I, I know. But, you know, look, maybe I'm showing the scientists to me. It is not a natural occurrence. It occurs because there's a lot of there are man-made influence all around and we don't quite have our handle on septage versus stormwater and, and we are taking steps to run it off but, but for example and i don't want to belabor this but if there's a million pounds of something going into the pond and we're just cutting off 
you know, 2,000 pounds, then we're not, it's a drop in the bucket. We just don't know if the efforts are going to be enough. Um, that's probably a third time I said, let's table it, leave it at that. Sure. All right. Let's, well, let's do it. We'll let's take your advice forward. this time and we will move on to uh, recreation program updates. Great. Um, so, oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, <laughs> everybody know and say thank you to the Concord Cryo Community Chest. Um, we applied for a grant allocation from the chest this year and were awarded $8,000 to support um, scholarships for residents attend our uh, summer camps. So many, many thanks to the chest for their years of support. Um, they, they've been a great partner with us um, and we look forward to continuing to work with them uh, in summers forward. So thank you to the chest. Um, Staffing updates, we're um, going to be reposting the assistant director job uh, in the next couple of weeks. I'm hoping uh, by mid-August at the latest, uh, hoping that other folks in other departments are getting through summer camp and they're ready to think about uh, potentially moving on and finding a new job here in Concord. So i um, optimistic that that timeline will work well for us. Um, we are also uh, working this week, introducing budgets to staff. It's a process that was never uh, formally introduced to our staff in the past, our, our program uh, recreation supervisors. So we're, we're working on getting everybody on the same page with budget goals for FY22. Um, and we're, we're excited about the fall. As Andy said, our brochure is going to be hitting mailboxes in the next week or so to support our fall registration on August 11th. Um, we will only be doing a, a one season brochure right now with COVID still a little unpredictable. We didn't wanna put out two seasons of information and potentially have to change it. So um, the brochure that you'll receive is just for September through December, but it's chock full of lots of great information and, and some new programs that the rec supervisors have been working hard uh, to design. Uh, that also includes uh, getting back into the schools. So we'll continue to run our childcare programs at the elementary schools moving forward, which is huge. Um, and we'll also be working with each school's uh, PTG group to support their after school needs specifically for that school's elementary students. So we'll be running chess, Legos, um, a before school sports program, things like that at all three elementary schools. Um, which was a relationship that we had started formulating about two years ago and then COVID shut us down before we were able to start at the Alcott School. So we're excited to be in all three elementary schools uh, running programs after school and before school hours this, this upcoming fall. Um, some basic facility updates. I just want to keep everybody in the loop with what's going on at Emerson Park. Um, the project is still scheduled to finish on time, which is around the end of August. Public Works has said that they do plan on uh, fall sports teams being able to use the fields as usual, which is end of August, early September. Um, so we're looking forward to getting those updates. We're cautiously optimistic that it will finish on time. The rain has been a huge issue for the team uh, getting into the park and getting done what they need to. But um, Public Works has been great and the, uh, the site contractors have been great working with us throughout camp. So. You'll see the machinery starting to move around the park. They're currently over by the track, working on some of that um, right now, getting the accessible pathways put in. So it will be great once it's finished and we're hoping that's in the next five, six weeks or so. Um, let's see, working on uh, the youth sports field rentals. Um, for the fall, we work with youth soccer, youth lacrosse, uh, youth football and uh, Youth Baseball actually does some programming in the fall as well, um, as well as a couple of adult sports programs. They'll be using field space at Emerson Park, the Ripley School, Rideout Park, uh, and then we schedule the Doug White Fields and the Upper Grass Field after 6 p.m. So working to get those things finalized, um, trying to have a stronger focus this year on turf management. Uh, so the fields in the past uh, have really been beaten down with overuse. Um, and we definitely don't want to see that happen at Emerson Park after all these great renovations. So I'll be working closely with the, um, the assistant director of public works and making sure that we're checking on the turf's health uh, and we'll, we'll be stopping the seasons right now 
on October 31st. If the turf looks healthy, then we'll be allowed to extend for two additional weeks into early November, which is what most of the youth sports groups have been requesting. So um, just some new initiatives. We're, we're trying to pay better attention to the health of all the field spaces in Concord to make sure that they're, they're lasting season after season. So um, more to come on that. Um, and then something small, uh, the public works department with this project is going to be purchasing a new uh, shed for us at Emerson Park. It typically sits over by the tennis courts. Um, and as you might remember last year, uh, it was vandalized a few times and uh, we had our equipment stolen. So they're gonna be installing a new stronger uh, shed for us, which will be great. We're gonna have some shared space with youth, youth baseball um, and it's going to be more interior to the park instead of uh, by the road access. So we're hoping that that move and that uh, new piece of equipment will serve us well this fall as we get our tennis equipment back out there and, and people back out on the courts. Um, special events wise, you can expect to see an event from us every month moving forward. Um, so September, we will be advertising a movie at the park and we're going to do it at Emerson Park, kind of a, a kickoff um, to the new park space this fall. Um, so that will be September 24th. As Andy mentioned earlier, Halloween weekend is a big one for us. So Saturday the 30th, we will be doing the Sleepy Hollow 5K road race at the BD Center. And then that Sunday, the Trunk or Treat event, which also takes place at the BD Center. Uh, November, we do a turkey hunt throughout town. So every Monday in the month of November, uh, we hide a, a turkey card in a park throughout town and whoever finds it brings it to the rec center and they get a fresh turkey for Thanksgiving that they redeem from Crosby's. So Crosby's has been a great partner uh, with us doing that. So that will be fun for November. And then December, um, we will be managing the um, annual tree lighting in Concord Center. Um, we weren't sure if that was going to be passed on with the transition of the visitor center, but we're excited to keep that close um, and run that event this year as well. So that will be the first Sunday in December. We'll have all this information in our brochure as well that you'll receive in your mailboxes. Um, sports programs, uh, DJ Fimiani has been doing a great job expanding our sports programs. Um, we now offer uh, pickleball lessons, which have been well received by the community. We have about 25 players that have signed up for lessons. Um, and we've reintroduced all of our adult sports. So women's basketball, men's basketball, um, co-ed volleyball, indoor and outdoor pickleball, all of those things are coming back. Um, and we had over a hundred residents participating in those this spring season, which has been great. Um, we also were able to bring back our summer lacrosse league. Uh, that is a, um, it tends to be a college age or a little bit older adult lacrosse league. It's really good competitive play. Um, we have about 125 players participating in that league that takes place up at the high school on uh, uh, one night a week, which has been great. So that was nice to have back that got canceled last summer. Um, and then looking ahead to the fall, we're planning on everything returning. So we will be offering the elementary and middle school ski programs again. Um, we will be running our youth basketball programs again. So lots of good things to come, hoping to get the community back into our space and, and back into our programs. And again, you'll see that in your brochure. So if people are asking questions, uh, you can expect everything to be coming back that, that we've had in the past, which is great. Um, also excited to be working with a local group of power soccer athletes. So I've mentioned this before, uh, my background is in recreation therapy, and I have a, a soft spot in my heart for power soccer athletes, which are uh, athletes that use power wheelchairs. Um, there's a local team in this region. There's never uh, seemingly enough participants in one town, so it's, it's typically regional teams, and they're going to be making the Hunt Recreation Center their, their home practice space. So we'll be uh, seeing some accessible sports uh, taking place at the Hunt Recreation Center, which is really exciting. Um, just a small group on the weekends. So that's an, a new program as well that we're excited to have in-house. In um, let's see, wrapping it up, we, we talked a little bit about White Pond um, and then summer camp. We are nearing the end of camp. It's been an excellent summer. We're week six out of nine weeks. Uh, we're at about 93% of our registration goal. So that's uh, over 1400 campers that have participated with us this summer. Um, 
the staff have been excellent. The programming has been excellent. It's really knock on wood been a great summer. Um, received lots of good feedback from families, even amidst the Emerson Park renovations and a little bit of a chaotic look. Uh, camp is running really well. So super grateful to all of our staff that have made that happen this year. Um, and registration for our before school, after school, early release programs are underway. Um, those are our typical school year childcare options. Um, and registration is looking really good right now. We are over 90% full at all of the elementary schools for after school, which is great this time of year. Um, and the more staff we get, the more spots we can open up. So if you know of anybody that's looking for some after school work opportunities from three to 6 p.m., uh, send them our way. Uh, again, we love to take more, more kids in the program, but we need more staff before we can do that. So that is the quick rundown of uh, all things Hunt Recreation. Does anybody have any questions on any of that stuff? So we've been uh, yeah, enjoying I, summer camp in our house. So thank yeah, you. I, oh, good. So I, I hate to bring this this, this up, but um, you know, the COVID issues are a little fluid right now out there, right? And this new CDC guidelines are coming in as far as masking indoors. Um, is there any? I don't think you'd have a contingency plan, but is there anything and on the staffing level to? Sure, the public or, or anything that that's being thought about to, you know, head head off any issues. As far as we know, yeah. right now, I don't even know how to uh, ask the question, but you know, yeah, it's out there. yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. Honestly, you know, we've um, I, deep down, I kind of have just been bracing for impact all summer. But um, you know, the way that the rules were put in place by the state before summer started, it did require us to assure that we had enough spacing. Uh, between all campers for three feet of distance indoors. So we do have that. We've kept our numbers small um, compared to what they could be in, in some weeks, recognizing our space limitations. So the kids can stay spread out when they're inside. Um, anyone that's unvaccinated is required to wear a mask when indoors. Um, outdoors, they're not required, but we are very well versed in how to assure social distancing outside should something change these last couple of weeks. Um, we have so much PPE, I think we could uh, provide it and cover the whole town with face masks. So we have masks at our fingertips. Um, we even had staff put masks on um, yesterday with all the smoke from the California fires. Um, so, you know, we're, we're very aware that we are, you know, kind of dancing on this line right now. Um, and we have our morning staff meetings where we do make people aware, you know, the, the numbers in Concord aren't growing astronomically, but there are some new cases happening and um, that's reality. And we make sure to remind our staff of that. So don't forget to make sure your kids are washing their hands. Don't forget to use the hand sanitizer that's in your fanny packs. Um, you know, just making sure that we give them the tools and the reminders to keep the kids safe under the current jurisdiction. Um, and we will pivot and be prepared to do whatever we need to should the state change the rules these last couple of weeks. Yeah. No, thank you for that. I mean, the, the most surprising part of the new guidelines are involve vaccinated people, encouraging vaccinated yeah. people indoors to wear masks. Um, so, you know. yeah, which then the regulations will follow with how that's used for youth and adult amateur sports, you know, as it was this past year with low risk yeah. versus high risk sports. So um, I have a very large binder of all of the COVID regulations and our responses over this last year that we can always fall back on if we need to, but knock on wood right now, we, uh, yep. We're feeling safe and happy and the kids spend 90% of their day outside. That's been a priority all summer is, is more fresh air, more outside, outside air. Um, we also have two large air filtration systems in the building um, that are supposed to filter an astronomical amount of square footage, um, far more than, than the spaces that they're in. So um, I don't know how well they work necessarily, but the town provided them for departments and uh, we have those things running every single day. Um, so we're doing everything that we possibly can to to keep the spaces clean and and uh, kids safe. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anna, thank you for the program update. Um, shall we move on to the strategic planning discussion? We shall. Um, and I wanted to be able to pull up a document here. I'm going to see if I can get my computer working while I talk. Um, so. Um, 
as you all know, a couple of months ago, we uh, we had a conversation, a starter conversation at least, um, about updating our recreation facilities strategic plan. That document was last updated in 2014, and while still valuable, certainly um, could use some uh, more recent up updates and additions. Um, thank you to those of you that did email me back and submit um, some feedback and suggestions for um, the scope of work. So the biggest charge that we have as a commission at this point in time is really trying to um, tighten up and create a scope of work that we can then provide to um, some consultants this fall. Um, I'm going to switch from my phone quickly yeah. to my computer. I think it's going to let me work. Well, well, it's great to have two of you. <laughs> there we go. Okay. 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 Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so that's our biggest charge. Um, the hope is that we could create a scope that we bring to consultants uh, later this fall, early winter, to start helping us actually formulate um, a plan. So with that, I'm going to share a document. Um, that's comprised of the feedback I received uh, from those that responded, as well as um, suggested next steps and, and ways that we should be trying to answer questions to help define this scope. So uh, if you can see this. So um, in terms of the feedback I received from you all for the objective of the plan, it's, it's summarized in this first sentence here, um, you know, developing a plan to assess current facilities. That was very clear in, in your feedback, looking at our current facilities and also therefore the lack of facilities, if, if there is such, um, as well as the needs for active and passive recreation in order to better plan services and programs um, and, and the capital improvements for the future. So that's the general gist of the feedback I received from everybody. Um, and in the document that I sent you all, it, it was a bunch of different facility plans from the state and across the country. And it, and it looked at the timeline that a lot of these plans were covering. We had talked about that briefly at the last meeting. You know, what's realistic? What's a good time period that you should be covering in these plans? Um, and uh, most of those organizations, you know, there were some that had 30, 40 year plans and then more so they were between, you know, the five to 10 year range. So um, again, the feedback, that I've received and that I think we're, we're thinking about as we continue this discussion is, you know, a five to 10 year time frame um, for facility, facility needs. Um, and then of course the goals. So, uh, you know, are we going to be revisiting the vision and the mission of the recreation department, our statement, our, our, our future outlook, um, our goal to optimize the utilization of our existing facilities. Are we doing that well? Are we filling the spaces with programs or is there, you know, a lot of downtimes in times when the facilities aren't being used? Um, certainly time to identify our changing demographics in the community. Um, there's large initiatives going on um, for, you know, diversity and equity and, and making sure that we recognize um, the access and or limitations that might be subconsciously uh, occurring for some user groups in town. Um, overall strengthening our services, what does that look like? What does that mean? Is that um, physical accessibility? Is that um, you know, making sure that our information is shared in multiple languages? Is that assuring that we have mm -hmm. more equipment for borrowing uh, out in the parks or, or in the spaces? And then of course, um, making sure that we engage and involve our residents in, in the facility planning and, and new initiatives. So those were the, again, the pieces that I received back from you all with, with goals um, and would like to have a discussion, I think at least tonight about those two pieces and make sure that we're, we're capturing um, at least a sense of what people at this point in time, our, our goals and objectives, um, recognizing and I think this is worth a discussion as well, that we might need a subcommittee um, that helps to kind of direct this initiative um, and have more discussions uh, about these next steps. 
Um, oh, Anna, just a, a question right on the first sense. I'm, at our last meeting when Kate was was here, we, we kind of kicked around sort of um, how big or how small we go and, you know, in terms of recreational assets, um, that goes beyond uh, things that are within the recreation department's umbrella. Have we kind of decided, or is that still open for discussion? Because uh, the first sentence says current facilities. Um, facilities to me has a certain ring to it. I, and I know you're, it's a question down further, what do we include in here? Yeah. Um, it, it, is your, I mean, have you and Kate further discuss that or is that still open for discussion? Just, totally open yeah. for discussion. All of this is still open for discussion. I think um, it's important to recognize the plans that the town does have in place as to not necessarily overlap efforts. So the open space and recreation plan that is um, currently active through the Natural Resources Commission is a, a great tool that maybe could be referred to if we're thinking that we want to include at least reference to some of these open space passive recreation sites that the town manages, owns, um, you know, maintains, things like that. Uh, but no, this is all completely open for discussion. Until we get it to the hands of a consultant, it's, it's totally up to us as a commission for the direction this goes. Well, but it also involves other other entities, as you indicate here. You know, um, if 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 we're planning to just focus on the recreation department per se, that's kind of the simple approach you can put in a can. If it's on recreation in general, that's that's a bit more difficult. So you know, it's mm -hmm. you know, from from my seat at at this point in my time now as the rec director, I. I spend a majority of my time communicating and planning with other stakeholder groups, not just what we, you know, not just managing what we physically own and operate as a recreation department. So um, I do think there is a necessity to include um, information about general recreation in Concord, you know, whether it be from the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail, which provides access to some of the recreation assets, including ones that the recreation department maintains and manages. Um, or um, White Pond and the, the um, Walden Pond and, and the resources that are available there. We use Walden Pond for fishing programs as a recreation department, for instance. So I think there's definitely overlap that needs to be um, acknowledged, whether we dive into the value and state of those facilities that we don't necessarily manage Again, that's that's open for discussion because as you mentioned, it certainly could be quite involved if we go that route. Yeah, and, and that's a dilemma because I think optimally to optimize the recreational planning across the town, you have to include all those interfaces. But the dilemma is, you know, that, that's more difficult. The, the more expansive you go, the more difficult it becomes. Although, yeah. I like the, the idea the of referencing yeah. them so that we have them captured in mm. the strategic plan, but we don't have to do a deep dive on them, Paul. So we know that they're out there and we know, like, for example, there are restrooms at Walden Pond, but there aren't at other, you know, on the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail or something to that effect. So that we just have a general reference and um, know that they're there, basically. You know, the other piece that the Recreation uh, Commission and, and Rec Department has been involved in most recently is the middle school uh, construction project. And we were, as you recall, um, writing letters of support for the basketball gymnasiums, which we would hopefully uh, be able to provide programming in. So um, there are definitely some assets that would need to be acknowledged, um, you know, and, and I don't know how necessarily we do that perfectly, but is it by scope of um, quantity of programming use by the recreation department. Like for those ones, like a middle school gymnasium, do we dig into that one a little bit more because we will be utilizing it more frequently as a recreation department, you know, the field spaces. We, I'm, I'm not a parks department, so, um, but I do schedule all the fields and I get the feedback from the youth groups that use the fields. So, and we definitely would want to and have in the past included information in the 2014 plan on Rideout Park and Emerson Park 
in the amenities of those spaces. So um, you have to remember that those aren't necessarily recreation department assets. Those are those are town assets, and again, kind of opens that door to what we. Include. Yeah, I, I think I think yeah, I think we have to do a little bit more than acknowledge. For example, if you look at the 2014 plan, the need for additional indoor gymnasiums that, that was in there. Lo and behold, it's now met by the middle school plan. And did we know that back back in 2014? No, but I think we have to be open that the recreational needs can be met in a number of different ways and point out what those ways are. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how you acknowledge the overlap, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, if this, this is Pete speaking, I've been impressed um, since I got on this commission at the amount of activity that's joint between the school system and the recreation department. Um, shared spaces, shared activities, after school activities. I mean, there's an enormous amount of collaboration that goes on between those two organizations. That's right, Anna, is it not? Correct, very much so. Yeah, and it seems to me almost impossible to do strategic planning without including the school element, at least, their facilities and their wishes and their thoughts about the future. Um, because we're so tightly linked to them in what we do every day, um, it would seem silly to try and isolate our planning from what they want to do. Yeah, how, how, to, how to include that is kind of the key. It's, it's clear. Yeah we need to do that and then we have the, you know the rail trail the Bruce Freeman rail trail as well it's you know, a, a prime asset what if, what if part of the strategic plan is an opening that lists out what the recreational assets are in town regardless of who it, it lists all of them out passive active facilities buildings etc schools and then Anna sort of can go into like who, who owns them, who's responsible for them, and does REC participate or utilize them in any way? So the Ripley administration building has a gymnasium that REC schedules and oversees. And maybe you're looking at just a couple of buckets as who's responsible for it, who's the, whose jurisdiction does it fall into, who's responsible for maintaining it, and do we schedule or utilize it for any programming? I, I think that, you know, when I think about that, I think of a big matrix of assets and who owns and operates them. So that's the current reality. But when we think of strategically, what, do we, what does a community need five, 10 years from now? Um, who, in addition to the recreation department, will need to collaborate to achieve that from a community to, to satisfy community need? So I think uh, taking the inventory and then projecting it to the future, you know, how we as a recreation department and commission collaborate with whom and, and, and perhaps how, I, I, think, I think that is a good start, Casey. I just think yeah, inventory a, is gonna be a big one. As a new member of the committee, I like Casey's idea as well, just to get a better understanding of exactly where everything fits and how it works and, and everything like that. So I, I like that as well. Yeah, and we can include in that inventory, by the way, at risk of um, sticking my neck out here, the Thoreau Club, um, Concord Country Club, the private pool that exists in town. Um, there's a lot of athletic facilities that are now sort of privately run. And who's to say that there's not a future collaboration to some degree or another between what we do and what they do. They're not necessarily competition. They could be collaborators. I think you bring up a good point, Pete, and it also helps us look at marketing too, because yeah. even if they are going to be collaborators, they are also competition and it helps us maybe take a look at the segmentation around that um, for future marketing. Who's meeting your outdoor summer swimming needs and swimming lesson needs? I think we have to be, you know, I think we have to acknowledge that. We have to be careful about that, though, um, because a strategic plan, I don't think by definition, a strategic plan of a, of a department, it could, it could acknowledge, but it can't include private entities who have their own business plans. 
Um, as part of inventory? It could even be as a side note that, you know, private facilities exist for golf, tennis, swimming, fitness. Because in some senses, if you look at it that way, it, it justifies why the town may not invest in uh, an asset like a golf course. You know, Conquer doesn't have its own town golf course. Brookline does. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's hockey rinks. Perspective. Well, but look, the Thoreau Club has swimming pools and they have tennis courts, mm -hmm. but the community has, you know, we're not going to say the community is, sat you know, is satisfied by the Thoreau Club. To, no, to definitely example. not, but it sort of gives us the landscape of, so if we have our community assets here, Paul, and then there's a listing of the private assets that exist. And so to some degree, there's the, there's the membership fees, there's the waiting lists and whatnot. But just to know as part of the inventory when we're looking at it as a town, what exists within the borders. Yeah, I think we also should look to the other plans. And you, your spreadsheet has a lot of them to see whether actually they include mm -hmm. private entities as well. And if so, how they do that. And this might be a, a nice time to think about um, how our discussions will move forward after tonight. So is it valuable to consider a subcommittee where a group of us gets together and starts to answer these questions that's listed in this document and, and add questions to it as discussions arise. Uh, we certainly can stick together as a whole group and, and take up a lot of meeting times, but um, that's an option that we do have. It's creating a subcommittee that really dives into this and helps uh, address these questions and then brings them back to the committee for a more detailed discussion with some insights that are already kind of laid down as a framework. Well, Anna, be, be, before I opine on that um, question, which is a good one, um, I took the liberty of looking at our last strategic plan. I didn't read every word, but uh, the, it was very, very thorough. And I have a question that, that I think we all should get the answer to before we proceed any further, and that is, how did it was an it was a huge project? It involved a lot of work, a lot of research, um, polling people to find out what they wanted, and investigation, and this and that. How did that get done? Where did the resources come from to put that strategic plan together? Um, so the funding itself uh, it was supported by the town and, and the recreation department paid for that document. Um, it was before I worked for the town, so I wasn't part of that process to know exactly how it felt and, and how it really um, got underway. But I do know now um, with the support of the town manager's office and the public information officer, which is a new position since that plan was done, we have a lot of excellent um, access to our community at our fingertips, which is which is great. So. I can't necessarily speak right now to how it was done and how it felt before, but I do think we're in a place in our town where we have a lot of uh, employees who could help get this information out and um, you know support us in, in getting something updated. Well, did the Rec Commission itself research and write that strategy? Um, I haven't seen a document on that, Pete. Honestly, in the opening of the... Um, strategic plan, it, it kind of refers to the recreation department and the commission in yep. supporting the initiative, but it, I don't have, and Kate doesn't have any documents um, that look like this, like what we're talking about now, like a formal scope of work. Um, certainly something I bet I could reach out to the company and get my hands on. They, they, the consultants that are listed on the document still exist. Um, so presumably they would have some original records of um, where the meetings kicked off. Yeah, my, 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 my understanding was it was almost completely outsourced to the consulting firm and they did the interviews both internal and, and went out for the the demographics part of it and did the community survey so it was largely outsourced mm -hmm. um i we think have a public was a information officer then right. you know to kind of head that off so they used the consultant in that right i'm sure there was consultation on the scope of work but i'm not sure the details of that right yeah, on your on your suggestion of a, of a, a subcommittee, and 
you know, whether it's some people in, in this group or not, I think having those li the reverse liaison, you know, if, if they're if we identify three or four or five departments that have our significant stakeholders and owners and operators, I think having their input in the planning group, just how to how to plan this and how to scope it out, that would go a long way to getting buy-in from from the stakeholders as, as part of the planning process. Um, you know, schools and Bruce Freeman and, and natural resource, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I agree with you, Paul, absolutely. Yeah. I think it would make sense to start off with a subcommittee of commission members that can then expand to include other stakeholders as, you know, as we sharpen things up a little bit and can do formal outreach. So we've created this subcommittee, would you be part of it? And then if it has to have a slightly different jurisdiction so that we can, so that as we're asking people to be part of it, we have a refined ask and a little bit more substance to be able to get them on board. Well, Casey, uh, the issue of a subcommittee, we only have five members. <laughs> You know, if, if we had 20 members, we could have a subcommittee of five and that might make sense. But what are we gonna do? Take three out of five members and exclude the other two? Uh, this is a very important- I don't think we need to do that, but we need to, I think it's hard to do this work and the other work at the same time in one meeting. Oh, oh then okay. we're here for hours and hours. Yeah, and it yeah. certainly wouldn't be restrictive, you know, only three members and two people are left out in the cold and have to, <laughs> you know, read the minutes in order to stay informed. Certainly not. I think it's more just a division of like time and resources, right? So Anna can't spearhead this on her own. I think there needs to be people from the commission who are willing to, to devote some time and energy to it. And that's, you know, I think part of the subcommittee piece of it is, you know, who's willing to take on some ownership to, to get into it deeper than just a once a month meeting at the point in the, you know, in, in our, uh, in our meeting, where we're all getting slightly fatigued. And as, you know, uh, internet's cut out once, mine's probably going to go soon, <laughs> who knows, but just to sort of designate its own time and um, and attention. Yeah, to, to Pete's point, though, we, we could have sort of a separate subcommittee, define a separate separate meetings, and the whole commission could participate if they want to in yeah. in a series of scoping meetings, and and maybe one, two, or three of us could have agendas for those scoping meetings. That's what I was just wondering. Is it is it such a thing that commissions of our small size and uh, relatively you know, basic information month to month to do an every other month concept of, you know, this month is a general recreation update. Next month, the whole meeting is strategic planning. Next month, general update. Next month, strategic planning. Is that, is that a thing? Does anybody know? It looks like Matt has his hand raised. Yeah, I just think that uh, a subcommittee actually needs to be, have members less than a quorum of the full committee, because if you have a full quorum of the full committee uh, attend, then you have to declare that it's a full meeting. So oh. you would actually have a subcommittee of two, I believe. I, I, I appreciate, I think that's an important point. I don't necessarily think that we need to avoid like open meeting and quorums. I think that, you know, we can, we could do what Anna recommended just having a every other month um, devote to strategic planning um, and keep it open. But Matt, I think for point of like clarification on procedurally how it's done, that's, that's extremely helpful. Uh, and I should mention that it's been our practice in the select board now in this fiscal year to start to have what we call focused meetings. And so, you know, we have a normal meeting and then once a month we'll have a what so-called focused meeting. I like your idea of, you know, every two months or something, because I mean, you, you don't meet as often as we do. Um, so. Okay. That's good to know that that wouldn't seem abnormal. To yeah. Anna, what is the pace though? Um, 
when do we, I mean, when looking backwards, when would we like to produce a plan by and working backwards, when do we, when do we need to produce a scope by? Cause that, that sort of defines the pace. I, mean, I think um, from what I understand, um, Kate said the special town meeting and Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, um, would be around December. And that's the meeting that we would need to go to to solicit funding for this plan since it wasn't uh, uh, pre-planned. So December is looking like the time period where we'd want to um, have a scope and some quotes from contractors to know, you know what we're getting into. And then from there, I, I don't necessarily know the timeline. I think some of the plans that I read, it took them 12 to 14 months to from start to finish to develop the plan once they had a consultant on board. So, you know, 2023, start of 2023-ish, um, potentially having a plan finalized and, and ready for reading. So if we do the every other meeting concept that we probably have maybe three uh, strategic planning sessions of this group, which I think would probably be enough if one or two of us did some spade work and kind of set the stage for those larger meetings, you know, the agenda and maybe some straw man documents. So I, I think we could do that. I, I, I do think having the whole commission participate in that. Um, we're having a couple of us just do the preparatory work in advance. I think that might be a good blend. Mm -hmm. It's a good idea, Paul. Um, for the sake of time, since we are around 8.30, um, if there's agreement on having two members who are helping to structure this, the focused uh, commission meetings and to do three meet, schedule three strategic man, planning meetings before um, December, then we could craft a motion around that and move forward. Does that seem good to folks? I Did can we, certainly commit my time okay. to a subcommittee, you know, outside of these meetings to start chipping away at some of these questions and developing something as well. So I'm happy to, to engage as often as needed. Yeah, and I, and I volunteered before, so I could work work on that as well. I think the concept, I, I think the concept is, is good, very good. Case. Yes, and uh, I'd be I'd be willing to work too in a small group um, to set the stage for this process. So is that Paul and Pete raising your hands to be the two who would um, who would sort of be dedicated to an agenda and um, some milestones that we should be hitting for these focused meetings? The two of us working with Anna, which I think she yeah. volunteered to. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. So and, um, and while I have while I have Paul here, um, we're both vaccinated. It would be really helpful if we could do this face to face, and and not online. Paul. Of course. I, I, I can help schedule that. some time for us to meet in person at one of our facilities. No problem. Face to face, with or without masks, Pete. <laughs> Oh, that doesn't matter to me as long as I get to punch your fist. <laughs> With hand sanitizer, you can touch me. Yes. And I've got all the PPE you need. Perfect. So yeah, I agree. thank you both. I'd like to make a motion, and this is, I'm going to try not to make it clunky, to designate um, Paul Bohm and Pete Funkhauser to a uh, subcommittee to um, establish the agenda and structure for the committee for the commission's uh, focused commission meetings regarding strategic planning. Nicely done. I think that yeah. was okay. Who's going to hit me up with a second? Do I have a conflict of interest by seconding it? <laughs> I second. Ah, good. Thank goodness okay. Matt's here. He knows all the rules. <laughs> He's yeah. the Robert not. Rules guys. Okay, <laughs> we'll do a roll call vote. Casey Atkins, aye. Pete, yes. Paul, yes. Jim, yes. Great, that's our quorum. 
All right. Uh, just one question. The first of these uh, commission planing meetings, would that be, when would that be? Which, do, do we have a meeting scheduled for August? September, or probably. September? Are we having a commission meeting in, in August? We typically don't meet in August. And especially since we're meeting at the end of July, right. I think that sort of tees us up nicely for a good September meeting, gives you and, and Pete some time to um, flesh an agenda and, you know, okay. organizational pieces. So September would be a focused meeting. Um, and maybe you guys, maybe we try and plan on the focus meetings uh, being in person. I, I do think there's a lot to gain from coming together for these sorts of discussions. So that yeah. could be an every other month concept as often as we could. So it'd be September focus meeting, um, November focused meeting. Um, I'd love to just have the opportunity for people to join via Zoom, like Jen, who's got, who's outnumbered by children right now. Yes. Yep. So the um, the law does allow us to continue remote participation through um, next spring, April, I want to say. So I just need to figure out how to get all the specialized equipment so the group can be filmed and people can participate and be seen. So I will talk with the public information officer and Minuteman Media to see how we can make that work. Okay, great. Thank Anna, you. in the meantime, it would be very helpful to me if you would email me this document that's on my screen where you attempted to lay out the various elements. Of course. Um, because that's going to be my starting point for thinking about my work with Paul and how we organize this. I will do that right after the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if we're all set on the strategic planning discussion, let's move on to number five reports from liaisons. Matt, do you want to start? Yeah, actually, um, this morning I was at the Trails Committee meeting and there was a discussion about uh, bike use on the trails in town conservation land. And um, there were some unauthorized trails that were built uh, near the end, uh, the current end of the Bruce Freeman Trail uh, near Powder Mill Road. And the person who created this trails is now uh, working to remediate them. And actually, there will potentially be a new hiking trail established in that area. But the other part of the discussion was that, um, you know, the members did point out that there is an unmet need today for kind of mountain biking use. And that while it's not likely to be appropriate on town conservation land, other towns have found plots of municipal land and use them you know, for the types of trails that mountain bikers tend to prefer, which kind of undulate around, go up and down, occasionally have jumps and things like this. Um, you know, it's, it's not quite a skateboard park, but it's a, a far cry from a hiking trail. Um, so you know, clearly the, the Recreation Commission came up as one of the potential bodies that might have an interest or ability to help make this happen and you know as you were talking about your uh, strategic plan you know and the kind of set of resources that are there and met and unmet resources the discussion was at a higher level than the individual ones but you know this is one that i would suggest gets put on the list for discussion at least um so that that's something that that came up at the trails committee the other thing the trails committee is going to do is they're going to make an evaluation of which of the trails are suitable uh, for bike use and of course with other regulations. Um, so, uh, you know, their, their assumption, however, is that there will be very few of those. Um, right now, there really isn't, aren't explicit rules about bike use on the trails and, and I think they're expecting to tighten those up. Um, so that that's probably the most relevant uh, input I've got from uh, that I can think of right now from other committees uh, as a liaison here. Matt, um, just as a side note on uh, mountain biking, yeah. the CCHS athletic trainer um, for the sports teams at the high school is he also works at Pedal Power and he is a big trail rider. 
and knows, and he lives in Carlisle, I believe, he knows all the trails around here. And if you're looking to get a good resource for some of those, um, here are some of his uh, colleagues at Pedal Power might be worth talking to um, and you know, be aware of the backlash of tightening restrictions on some of the on. Uh, oh yeah, well, I, I understand. You know, I know at Estabrook is like really great for mountain biking, but I think that might be a sensitive spot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there. I mean, and you know, Lincoln years ago, of course, had lots of conflicts, and yeah, I, I think that you know they ended up doing a lot of restrictions, and that stabilized over the years. So. Um, yeah, the, there's, it's just an ongoing discussion. I should also mention just because uh, you had some discussion of diversity, equity, and inclusion as an element of your plan. I think that's excellent. Uh, the select board is just uh, kicking off its own process with this. And uh, there is a request before us to create a diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, commi commission. Um, so just, I, I guess, FYI, that, that's, out, that's out there. Thank you. Um, Amrith is not on with us. So that's the Finance Committee. Paul, CPC. Um, I, yeah, I don't have a lot to report. I was at my first meeting, uh, and we were just celebrating the passage of the uh, the 2021 warrant article and getting all that funded. I think the application process uh, is underway. The informational process for the for the CPC funding, I think it closes September 21st. Apropos of my previous um, um, mention of CPA, I took a look at the, um, the, the 2020 uh, uh, Preservation uh, Commission report, which is online. And I looked under recreation to see what, not specific projects, but what, what was listed there. And it'd be worthwhile, I don't wanna go through that, worthwhile taking a look at the recreational opportunities that are listed under the, the, um, the, the, uh, the Concord uh, the CPC plan, because it does have a, a, a lot of, um, it's, it's not just the preservation per se, it's a uh, facility, it's, and it's not fixed facilities, no buildings, but it does have parks and fields and a, a lot in that um, in that area, and it's faintly reminiscent of what's in the 2014 strategic plan because it does talk of needs for. It says <laughs> under baseball diamonds and softball fields, it says the town has a need for approximately 1.8 adult and 1.2 youth softball fields. I have to believe that comes from the the strategic plan, just that level of specificity. But but it's interesting, uh, my, my point on CPC is that the, the recreational uh, funding of various types to meet various needs is allowable under the CPA. Um, so that's, um, and I'm still learning all the, all the ins and outs. I think a strategic plan will be really helpful with the community preservation. Um, committee since it's it, it is comprised of so many members and they go out and do deep study on the projects that are presented before them but ultimately it's sort of how you know you've got this much money it's never enough money to fund all the projects and where is the need coming from and a document like this could certainly be helpful so you could truly determine how you get that 0.8 youth softball field <laughs> need fulfilled for the town. <laughs> I agree because that's going to set in motion. I think a template for when the CPC of the future looks at projects. Well, does it fit into the recreation strategic plan? I don't know if they do that or if they did that, but I think you know if I were in the CPC five years from now, I would take a look at our plan that we're in progress and see whether we mentioned that need. Definitely. Okay. Let's see here. Um, Okay, any other liaisons? I think we are good. Any other public input? We have no more members of the public. Um, next meeting date, Anna. Yep, so. Our friend from the public who's on the finance committee but not a liaison didn't wanna hang on until the other public comment period. We lost everybody's interest. We had three people at one point. It was a big night for us. 
Uh, Casey, question. Do, do we really want to have two public comment periods or is that a typo? I think this is a template um, agenda that we've used for a long time. Is that safe to say, Anna? Yeah, I think it's just been adopted, Paul. I don't know if there's a rhyme or reason. It's all open for adjustment. And it's sort of a lot of people at the top of a meeting sometimes want to do public input. It's true. Usually that's where there's a lot of public input, but this was sort of added in as like a, is there anything else anyone wants to add? That's yeah, I, my right. My committee experience is limited, but once I've been in the public comment it comes at the end. I, I don't know, Matt, if there's any preference. You have more, a wider. Uh, usually at the end. And then, you know, if there is a high interest uh, agenda item that following that agenda items discussion. Right. But not at the beginning. No, I've, I have not seen that before. I was taken aback myself. Really? I've seen it at the school committee meetings before. It was a while ago. I could be uh, wrong. And I have to admit, I, I haven't had much experience with school committee meetings. My the blind only, spot in town. <laughs> the only, you have very few blind spots, I think, Matt. But um, the public input that I've seen in the beginning is people that want to jump on and share something nice and not stick around for the whole meeting. That's really the only time yeah. I've seen people chime in in the beginning is, hey, BD Center is doing great. We love it. Thanks. And, and there, typically, what I've seen is if somebody uh, has that on their mind, that they would contact the chair in advance and that the chair could recognize that person at the beginning just to, to make a statement as part of their you know, chair's remarks or something. That's what we would do at the select board, something like that. Okay. So I can, I can remove that if everybody wants me to do that on the next agenda. Thanks. Okay, um, yeah. so next, next meeting is what you asked me, Casey. So if we skip August, and we go for the last Tuesday of September. We're looking at September 28th. And that would be a strategic planning session? That would be the focus meeting. Focus meeting, OK. Well, that's, that's fine with me. This is Pete speaking. But does that mean, Paul, that you and I and and Anna would get together prior to that meeting to oh, yeah. work, out, work out some discussion items for the meeting? Yeah, we should probably have a conversation offline. I, I, I'm just thinking we're probably gonna need a couple of discussions to set that meeting up to have a productive meeting. Uh, right. And, and we probably are gonna, whatever we produce as an agenda or background documents, we probably wanna do that or we, maybe several days to a week before that. So, you know, we, we would have a, a, a bit of a deadline before the 28th of September to, to I haven't thought much about it. We, we should have, probably have a conversation sometime in the next week, just to, how we want to structure our little group. But yes, we, we definitely need a couple of times before that, I think. And I would think we'd need at least two meetings before the 28th in order to pull I, something together. Um, so, um, do, yeah. do you want to get back, Paul, do you want to get back in touch with me and, and Anna and set that Yeah, let's up? Do, do that, the three of us, uh, you know, outside of the, uh, the main agenda here. So that, which will, will, will you be our scheduler though? So you'll be back to us. Who, me? Yeah. You just, you know, pick a I date can, and can, make sure it's okay with us and we'll. I can, I can handle that. Perfect. I believe in you, Paul. <laughs> Paul, 30 dates has September, you know. It's, 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 just pick one. This way you have a little bit more runtime. Uh, the 28th <laughs> of September uh, works for me. Does anybody have a conflict? No. And that would be okay. an in-person meeting, uh, probably at the, the Hunt Recreation Center, but I'll, I'll follow up with the location. Great. OK. Um, any other business to discuss? Would anyone like to make a motion to close the meeting or adjourn the meeting? I so move. Okay, I second. And we'll do a roll call. Casey Atkins, yes. Pete, yes. Paul, Jim, yes. yes. Paul, yes. Or the meeting has been adjourned. Thank you, Anna, very much. I know this is an absolutely crazy time of the year for you. So 
Thank good? you. You're welcome. Thanks. Nice to see everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome, all. Jim. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thank you.